So welcome everyone. My name is Sona Rasti. I'm today's moderator and I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers and welcoming all of you. Um, so just to give you a brief outlook of how this will look like, uh, we have three speakers today. The first one will be Pierre Monier. Pierre Monier. And I bragged about being able to pronounce the French name flawlessly and now see what has happened to me. Um, who is the co-coordinator of Diamas and the deputy director of Open Edition. Um, he's also the co-coordinator of Operas and we're lucky to have him here with us today because he will give us a brief introduction into the Diamas project and its objectives, as well as a bit of context for the survey that in the end ended up being uh, the source for the landscape report. Um, we also have here with us Jan-Erik Fransvork um, from the Arctic University of Norway, who is an open access advisor and academic librarian who led all the efforts leading to the document that is now the landscape report. And he will give us some insights into the findings um, that you could find within that document. And um, then we have um, our dear colleague, Eva Milinchak Slody. Uh, from the University of Zagreb, who is responsible for e-resources and scholarly communication within the library of the University of Zagreb. And um, she will give us an insight into diversity aspects of the landscape report, um, highlighting a few aspects that might come in quite handy when looking closer at the findings of this report. And with that being said, I will now give the word to Pierre. Um, yes, Pierre. Thank you very much, Sona. So I'm going to share uh, my presentation with you. Okay. Uh, and uh, so just a quick uh, word of introduction. So thank you very much uh, uh, for being with us. I'm very glad to uh, to be with you in uh, in this uh, webinar to to present uh, to you the the conclusion of uh, the survey that we launched uh, some months ago. Um, uh, and, uh, and the landscape report more particularly. Um, my role in this uh, webinar is to give you a short introduction regarding the, the Diamas project, uh, that is uh, the project that supports all this work, uh, and to tell you uh, how we uh, worked on the preparation of uh, the survey that uh, uh, collected the information that is captured in the, in the landscape report, and what is the role of the information we, we uh, collected as well. So basically, uh, the, uh, uh, the DMS project is a European Commission funded project. Uh, the duration of it is uh, three years. It started in September 2022, so some months ago already. Uh, we are almost uh, midway in our journey towards the completion of the project. Um, uh, the budget of the world project is around 3 million euros and we have three, uh, 23 public service scholarly organizations from 20 European, uh, 12 European countries participating in this project. You can see here on the right side of the screen the nice diversity of types of organizations participating in this project. Diversity not only in terms of uh, uh, countries represented from all parts of Europe, but also diversity in terms of uh, types of stakeholders, types of organizations, uh, where you have research performing organizations, but also policymakers, but also uh, organizations which are more involved into the funding of research. But also uh, you have uh, umbrella organizations gathering the publishing community, libraries, of course. So uh, uh, I'm quite proud to say that with this consortium, we have almost all types of stakeholders around the table working together uh, to uh, support the development of the Diamond OA model in Europe and the institutional publishing, open access publishing. So the objectives of the, pro of the project are defined uh, quite clearly. So the first objective uh, is to provide the research community with an aligned, high quality and sustainable open access scholarly communication ecosystem. Uh, the second objective is to create a community uh, and to create a supporting services and non-technical infrastructure for what we call institutional publishing service providers, 
So you should be familiar with this acronym IPSP that will be uh, mobilized a lot during this presentation, um, uh, that uh, which uh, uh, let's say uh, refer to a specific type of uh, open access scholarly uh, publishing, uh, particularly in Europe, which is more particularly supported by institutions. Uh, meaning not only universities and research performing organizations, but also learned societies. So the idea would, would be to create a community to uh, develop supporting services and a non-technical infrastructure to help this sector to adopt common standards, guidelines, and best practices. And the third objective of the project is to develop those common standards, th those guidelines, and those best practices based on what we currently call the EXIP, uh, that stands for Extensible Quality Standard for Institutional Publishing. Basically, it's, uh, um, it's a quality standard dedicated to uh, Diamond OA that we have uh, been working on uh, until recently because we have just published the, the let's say, the, uh, the final version of the EXIP uh, recently. Um, the Diamas project uh, unfold into three uh, uh, three main phases. So the first phase uh, during uh, so the first month of work of the of the project is or was to understand the landscape of institutional publishing service providers in the European research area. So I explain all the acronyms for you because this is a European project. So you have a lot of acronyms. That's normal, but I try to explain them. So IPSP stands for Institutional Publishing Service Providers, and it's in the Europe, uh, which is referred to as the Euro European Research Area. The European Research Area, but Jan Eric will explain that to you a, a bit more, is a little bit more than the European Union because it uh, involves. Uh, more countries than just the European Union countries. It's really a lot of uh, diversity of countries uh, in the European continent. So in this first phase, uh, we did this uh, 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 this mapping exercise to uh, to map the current landscape of IPSPs. We mapped also the existing quality standards, and we benchmarked uh, uh, the. We try to 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 uh, to do a kind of benchmarking exercise of the current IPSP landscape. Then now uh, there is the, the second step, and we are currently in the project. We are currently in the in this in the middle of the second step, which is to improve coordination, quality, and sustainability of these institutional publishing uh, service providers. Uh, uh, and what we try to do is to develop a lot of resources, such as a common access point, such as toolkits, guidelines, best practice. Uh, and other resources. And what we try to do is to uh, co-create those resources with the community, uh, uh, which is quite uh, important. And then we are already preparing for the third phase, but that, that will be more intense, uh, let's say, uh, during the last year of the project, uh, to formulate policies and strategy recommendations uh, uh, towards particularly uh, the leaders of the institutions which are involved into the uh, the Diamond OA uh, publishing or the institutional uh, open access publishing, because um, and, and that's something that uh, we have already already uh, learned. Uh, uh, let's say uh, a lot of publishing activities take place inside the institutional landscape, so inside the universities and the research performing organizations, but they are not always well supported and recognized and acknowledged by the uh, leaders or the top leading level of the institutions themselves. So the idea would be to advocate and to recommend to the uh, governance level of those institutions to better support uh, the publishing activities that take place inside their own institution. So that's a quite an important uh, uh, thing that we, we would like to develop. So what we're going to talk about uh, 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 what we're going to talk about today is the mapping of the current landscape landscape of IPSPs. In terms of activities, uh, the project uh, unfolds into different uh, what we call work packages. 
Uh, one is dedicated to mapping the European landscape, and that's uh, led by the uh, Arctic University of Norway. So uh, Yannick will present to you uh, the result of this uh, work package more particularly. There is another one which is to set standards and assessing quality gaps for IPSPs led by the FECIT, which is a, a, a funding agency, research funding agency in Spain. Uh, there is uh, a work package dedicated to uh, knowledge sharing by dev developing a common access point and gathering different resources to uh, no share knowledge between uh, inside the community to better support this type of publishing, and that's led by OPRAS. There is a work package dedicated to support the sustainability of uh, institutional publishing led by Spark Europe. There is a work package dedicated to prepare policies recommendations and strategies led by GISC in the UK. And there is a work package dedicated to better connect, engage with the community, disseminate and communicate the results of the project led by Liber. Uh, so here you, you will have, uh, uh, let's say, the, one of the main results of the work package dedicated to mapping the European landscape. And this uh, landscape report that will be presented to you uh, uh, by uh, Yannerik and Eva, uh, will is the result of an extensive survey that we did during the first year of the of the project uh, to try uh, to uh, uh, to map uh, the institution publishing landscape through a survey. Uh, of course, uh, you will have the details about uh, the the results of the survey. And the idea would be was when we did the survey to help understand the landscape of institutional publishing, uh, to build uh, both on its strength and innovation or innovation capacity uh, for a more equitable publishing ecosystem, but also acknowledging, acknowledging that resources in this sector are quite limited and then uh, to see how we can improve the situation. Uh, to prepare the survey, uh, we did a lot of work. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know, Yannerik and Eva, if you remember all the work that we did. Uh, no, you don't remember because <laughs> it was <laughs> sometimes it was, uh, 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 let's say, uh, difficult. Uh, for example, we had to develop a common terminology, and this was quite uh, uh, difficult and a, a lot of work to, to stabilize the definitions of the words that we were using to be sure that we understand each other and that we were referring to the same reality, because sometimes we are using words uh, in a fuzzy way uh, with a, a lot of variations uh, regarding the definitions about what we think, uh, what we refer to when we talk about uh, publication, publishing, uh, service provider, publishers, and so on. So we did this work to establish a common terminology that was captured into a glossary that we has been published. And that was quite in, in, in important to do that work. And then we identify the project's need to know and uh, uh, to know uh, and source the questions that we wanted to uh, uh, to ask in the survey. Uh, we had a lot of work to cut down the questions also because we had too many questions, of course, and we had to to really cut down the questions to to make it feasible for the uh, respondents uh, to uh, uh, to answer the survey. We did a lot of work to translate the survey into many different languages and European languages to make sure that there would be a, a good adoption of the of the survey and a good response rate from the, the variety and the diversity of the linguistic communities across Europe, because Europe is a multilingual continent and we have uh, to uh, really take that into consideration if we want to have a good adoption of what of the work that we are doing in the European project. So we put a lot of effort to have this survey uh, in different languages and we developed the glossary, we tested and we developed, of course, an FAQ to help the respondents. And the aim of the survey is uh, captured here to create a map of the landscape in Europe uh, to understand who are the IPSPs, uh, where uh, they are, how they interact with their scholarly institution, uh, how they work, in which conditions, what are their main challenges. And that's uh, what uh, will be presented and is presented in the landscape report. But now it's time for me to close my presentation because I'm at the end of my journey and I can uh, give the torch to uh, Yann Eric uh, to present the result of this uh, impressive survey that we did uh, together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre.
before you start, and Eric, just for all uh, participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, uh, in the um, question and answer tool. Um, we will have a dedicated discussion session after the presentations because they are so intertwined that some questions may be answered by the presentations you are just waiting for. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat already. Thank you. And with that, um, I stop interrupting Jan Eric presenting <laughs> the gracious uh, findings. Thank you. I'll see if I'm able to share my screen in an intelligent way here. Hopefully you are now seeing my my uh, presentation in full screen. Good. Um, I've been introduced, so I won't say too much. Uh, I'm going to talk about the landscape report and uh, some of the background. Um, uh, some of the background for the for the project is that early research showed that there were problems with the structure of open access publishing. We have the the Open Access Diamond Journal study, which um, I was a part of, and other uh, partners in the project also were a part of, where we found a wide archipelago of relatively small journals serving diverse communities. And there's very uh, small scale activities was found there. And there's also other research uh, that points to the same. Uh, we know we found that Diamond Open Access was an important part of institutional publishing, and the Diamas is uh, to look at institutional publishing, not only Diamond, but uh, as Diamond is so big a part, it becomes uh, important also for the Diamas project. Uh, the work, uh, it was much work. I don't want to do this again, but um, uh, at least 40 competent and interested persons from around 20 organizations. I mean, nearly all partners in the AMAS also took part in the work in Work Package 2, and also a couple of persons from outside the project, from, from important countries that were not represented in the AMAS. We started our work in September 2022, and we delivered a report at the end of November 2023, and dissemination didn't start un until February. Uh, there's little to build on because no, no data had earlier been collected on institutional publishing as such, and there was no organizations geared to that. So we had to start from scratch. We had initiated a large survey that Pierre is talking about. And an important term was the institutional publishing service provider that we coined in the early phase. And that covers institutional publishing activities, service providing to such uh, institutional publishing, and organizations that combine both peer publishing and service providing. There are many of them. We created the survey, trying to cover many aspects. Too many aspects, I think, our uh, respondents will will say. And we also tried to identify possible institutional publishers and service providers in the era. Uh, I'll come back to the era. Uh, in order to contact them, uh, as we most of us come from open access publishing and diamond open access publishing, the data we had, the data we knew, was skewed towards open access journals publishing. But we engaged all the networks we knew. We sent out more than five thousand emails to email addresses in the late from late March to early May, in ten different languages, and we also sent emails to email lists asking organizations to, to distribute uh, these emails to their members, etc. Uh, Turkey was left out of the survey due to the earthquake in January. Uh, we sent it out in September, and a country report for Turkey is planned for later this year. That is work in progress. Uh, one important lesson that we learned for others who want to, to uh, have surveys, the direct emails did not work. It was the mass emailings to lists and organizations that gave us responses. And what did we get? We got uh, 685 responses that we could use. The era, as Pierre said, it's not only about EU, it's uh, the uh, European research area and associated members. That means, for instance, that Norway, where I come from, is represented. We have Iceland, we have uh, Switzerland, for instance, uh, Turkey should be here. Uh, we have um, Morocco and Tunisia, we have Israel and we have Georgia and Armenia, for instance. Uh, who are not uh, well, some of them are aspiring to become part of the EU and some are aspiring to stay outside. Um, 
the responses were from an, uh, rather uneven geographical distributions. But what we find is that most countries were adequately represented. Our numbers indicate that a major part of IPSPs in Europe and the individual countries are represented. But as always, the smallest one are underrepresented. The, the standalone journal uh, is very much absent from the responses. A quarter, or, sorry, three quarters of our respondents were institutional publishers, one quarter service providers. But this is self declarations. And you see from the responses that organizations that are identical in what they do. Uh, differ in how they classify themselves. So this is a very, it, it is a difficult concept. 90% of our respondents publish journals, but most publish relatively few, less than few, less than five, sorry. <laughs> Major findings is that countries are more different than regions are, which came as a bit of a surprise because we had planned a report to be structured around, around regions in Europe. Uh, and that turned out to be totally meaningless because neighboring countries would be very different and they could be more similar to countries in other parts of Europe. They also see through the surveys that the organizational scholarly publishing activities on the national scale is very important. And that's about support and administrative structures. It's about networks and organizations and funding opportunities, how they're organized. And then this kind of, this structure is, um, for instance, it explains that Croatia and Serbia are, have large dots on the map, while uh, the UK, for instance, is very small. And that's about organization, and that influenced also the response rate. Finances and organizations, well, uh, two thirds are non commercial public organizations, and of course, service providers are more likely to be private companies. Many of them are uh, do services against the fee, they're, co they're commercial companies earning money from services. Roughly 60% are part of a parent organization. They mostly perform small scale activities, heavily dependent on a voluntary and in kind contribution, which means that you can have a problem if you're successful because the success doesn't bring you added resources. Diamond model is very common. Uh, APC is used as a revenue stream by 19% of open access journals publishers. And uh, that doesn't mean that 19% of journals use them. If a large uh, publisher has one journal that um, uses APC, they will have answered yes here. So then uh, less than 19% of journals use APC. Uh, what came as a surprise to me was that voluntary author contribution is used by nearly one quarter of all the respondents. Uh, more than half of, of all publishers that only publish Diamond, they rely on fixed and permanent funding from the parent organization, and 20% rely on periodically negotiated funding from the parent. We can't add these percentages for some respondents use both kinds of, of support from the parent. Uh, generally, they, pay, they place high reliance on this kind of parental support, just like babies do. Uh, 31 percent rely on content and print sales uh, we see a lot of traditional publishing uh, in europe still paper-based sales of books uh, subscription to paper journals uh, but generally they pay they place low reliance on this kind of funding 70 percent would consider cooperating with others to save costs uh, at least in some of the areas for instance it services production services etc uh, all these areas, more than 40% have an inclination to cooperate. So there are opportunities here for the, the publishing actors. When it comes to open science practices, we see that the double anonymous peer review this is the most common and used by three quarters of respondents. Uh, open peer review is used by only 17%, but about 30% say they're willing to implement this in the future. And uh, what we think we see is that OJS, which is the most important publishing tool, doesn't yet have a good implementation of open peer review. So many will be waiting for that before they start experimenting with it. 90% uh, of the journal output from our respondents is uh, open access, uh, three quarters of conference output, and a bit more than half of academic books are open access. In Eastern Europe, which is one of our regions, we see that Nearly 100% of journals are open access, which is impressive. 
academic journals is the most important output format. 90% uh, of respondents use this. So the journals, um, in discussions, we often concentrate on the on journals, uh, and we tend to forget about books and conference outputs. We shouldn't do that because they're also important parts of the uh, of the landscape. Some uh, eighty percent of respondents adhere to an open access or open science policy on some level, either the national, institutional, or own. There's a wide uh, variation between countries. In some countries, the national policies are not important at all. In some other countries, they act as if they have a national policy that everyone adheres to, though it doesn't exist. Uh, policies is more most important for open access journals. Uh, I think that for books and other types of output, policy work hasn't been as, as extensive and isn't as uh, mature as for journals. Only 45% consider the content well indexed and the rest want improvement. They have problems with satisfying participation criteria. 60% uh, of them paying for membership and recurring charges is 40% have a problem. More than 40% have a problem with that. For instance, paying the annual bill to Crossref and Crosscheck. Uh, when it comes to equity, diversity, inclusion and, big, and belonging, that this is generally not well implemented. Uh, used to say that most respondents is uh, somewhere on the scale between bad and awful. Takeaways. The typical institutional publisher is small and alone. They need better and more stable, more reliable and more long-term financing so they don't spend the resources hunting for money instead of doing the publishing. They need partners to cooperate with and we see that many are willing to cooperate. We should exploit that. They need support, competence must be made available, advice and best practices and how to best align with these and support on, on how to implement these various practices and technical options. It's not self-evident how you do this. But we also see there's a strong willingness to align with open science practices and good publishing practices. And that is very promising. I'm nearing the end now. There are outputs available. There's a treasure trove on in our Senodo. Um, this presentation will be made available to you later, so you don't have to note down all the links here. You will find them. Uh, we have a list of uh, work package two outputs. Those in bold are the most important ones. The full length 237 uh, page report is, of course, for those who are very interested and want to go into detail where uh, all areas are. Um, there are a lot on, lay, on numbers and tables there that, uh, for the interested reader. This is written as a tool for the other work packages, and it was not written for the general audience, but it will have value for, the, for you. Then we have made a synopsis of the results, a short version of the full-length report, written by people who didn't write the full-length report, so there's some, some critical distance to, the, to that. And then we have country report where you can see what did we write about your country and what has other countries that you're interested in done uh, on this. And if you want to hear more, you have Sona and me on a podcast here. Thank you. I'm ready to answer questions and I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jan Erik. Okay, so with these well, broad insight that he just presented to us. Um, Eva, will you take the torch and enlighten some of them a bit more? Uh, yes, thank you. thank you. I will just share my screen in a second. And yes, uh, I will uh, continue on this great uh, introduction by Pierre and a lot of details by, by Jan Eric. And I actually got the uh, easy and comfortable uh, role in cherry picking some of the results that uh, are perhaps uh, interesting and colorful and that show uh, some relevance to the uh, to the broader audience so uh, let me go through that so the main point is uh, something that was already uh, stressed before the diversity uh, of the landscape that we are dealing with. So we knew that from the start, but we didn't actually know uh, how the uh, 
how the survey results are going to end up uh, uh, reflecting exactly this starting point. So, uh, and also Jan Eric mentioned that uh, where is this diversity manifested? So we didn't spot a lot of diversity among regions. That is true. That could be partly uh, due to the way the regions were defined. So maybe if we, because there are different ways to classify European countries into regions, maybe different classifications would yield different results. But the way we did show that us that there are more differences between countries than between uh, regions. And that's, that is important because of the, as again, Jan Eric stressed, this is an important starting point for the rest of the project and for the recommendations and tools and practices that will be uh, uh, developed further. So, uh, the importance of these differences also stems from organization of scholarly publishing activities on a national scale, and they are affected by different funding opportunities. Uh, the existence of platforms and infrastructures that are very uh, uh, relevant in some places, but are non-existent in some other places. There are also some networks and organizations that can take a leading role in some regions and countries, especially. And of course, there are policies and po political frameworks that work differently in different, and they are usually national, so they work differently in different countries. Uh, and all these differences are manifested already on the first step when we look at how much content is available in open access uh, in certain countries. And when you look at this table, you can see the overall percentage in bright, uh, bright orange. So for journals and for books as prime uh, examples. And then when you look at the same region, for instance, blue is Northern uh, Europe, you will see that uh, Finland has almost 100% journals in open access, but for United Kingdom, it's a far uh, less lesser share. Also, for instance, when you look at Southern Europe, you will see that Italy is way ahead with open access to books for unlike other countries in this region, which can lead in open access to journals. So clearly there are some reasons for such differences. Um, and we can try to explain by other uh, elements of the survey, we can try to reach some explanations for this. And also something that I think I've uh, mentioned earlier, why these national differences matter, they are important because every time when we try to consider some future actions and plans that are uh, aimed primarily at increasing uh, open access content, especially diamond open access, then we have to realize who are, where are the gaps and who leads the way in this way. So we can probably find some good practices or recipes that could be maybe adopted elsewhere. Uh, and it is important to have this kind of tailored actions that are really um, based on an actual knowledge of the landscape. So they are not uh, uh, very broad or very, I don't know, superficial, but that actually take into account what, what exists and what is known about. Uh, one thing that was, I think, already mentioned, but need to be uh, stressed again, this survey had some limitations and weaknesses. Sometimes we had some smaller groups of respondents that could have maybe uh, a large effect on the results, especially when we look at uh, country reports, but besides that, we can still think that this is really informative and results have a value. Uh, so the first thing where, where we do spot uh, important differences is, of course, funding, something that is really relevant for all of the IPSPs that we uh, analyzed. 
and we ask them about their uh, sources or forms of funding. So where do they get funding from? And they could offer multiple uh, uh, responses uh, and they could tell us how much do they rely on certain forms of funding and how stable are those funding sources. And we have seen uh, that uh, among the options offered, there were some uh, more prevalent and some less, but it is important that each form was uh, marked as non-applicable by a very important share of respondents. So even the ones that were uh, very relevant to some were not applicable to a uh, very significant share from 40% to almost 80% per certain options. So when we go to recommendations from that, we can uh, not recommend one single uh, source of funding that would be a best for all the European area. And we have to recognize that we there will be different models that will work in different contexts. Uh, the one source that was most prevalent was a fixed and permanent subsidies from parent organizations. They were all most frequent uh, as most relied upon, but also considered most stable and you can see uh, their percentages. So, but still it's not, this is the most prevalent, but it is not for the majority. Uh, so it's still not available to more than 40%. And of course, this depends on whether the IPSP has a parent organization or not, but this is something that we can see as a cornerstone of uh, our uh, IPSP uh, funding mechanism. Uh, further sources of funding could be considered as some sort of a large public funding mechanisms because many of our respondents rely that they rely often and highly on permanent public government funding or some time limited grants uh, that they receive. Uh, and even uh, when they are not uh, uh, permanent, so even if they are time limited, a certain number of IPSPs uh, find them as a stable source because they are recurrent. So this is quite consistent with some previous research on funding mechanisms uh, around countries that were published. But also if you go and look at our country reports, you will see that simply certain countries do have some large scale public funding mechanisms and they are very important to them. Uh, and when we look at which, uh, who are the funders providing these kind of fundings, because our respondents could answer and uh, list uh, a number of funders that are relevant to them and name them. We find that most IPSPs are funded by local, regional or national funders almost as exclusively. So they most often mention uh, the funders that are either governmental bodies or like ministries or associations for scholarly publishing or uh, in rare cases, uh, uh, funders who fund research. Uh, so not national bodies, but really research grant funders. And except for French, all of these funders are funding exclusively their national journals. So that is something that is very typical and sometimes not national, but even like uh, local markets and local journals. And this is, uh, this is something that has uh, important implications. So, uh, because these national uh, funding schemes are among themselves, again, very different in uh, the way they uh, uh, allocate uh, resources. So which publishers, which journals, which books are eligible uh, for funding. It is not the same across Europe. Uh, some of those funding schemes uh, and mechanisms do have some issues with for instance, transparency or uh, very much with timeliness. That was something that was uh, stressed in uh, Croatian cases uh, often. 
And those uh, funding schemes also have uh, diverse levels of dedication to open access or to diamonds. So not all of them uh, incentivize strongly open access. And that is that has implications also on the shares of open access content that is available in certain countries. And they do uh, promote different uh, values, different qualities, and use different uh, criteria to award these funding. And they are not always aligned with uh, aims of open science and open access. So that is something they can incentivize different uh, behavior of our IPSPs. And one other thing that is also very important since this uh, large funding schemes are national. They are awarded, as we have seen, often by uh, government bodies. They are also uh, political in nature, and they are uh, they are responding to changes in uh, politics, uh, and they can be volatile. So they can change abruptly in some cases, and that brings sort of instability in our uh, system. So not everywhere, in not in all countries, but some of our IPSPs show this uh, fear of changes in the uh, be, change criteria or change uh, ways of allocating these resources. So there needs to be some kind of political and practical alignment on this uh, in this area. The other way, uh, the other topic where there is a lot of diversity in across Europe is uh, existence of open access and open science policies and how are they uh, aligned. So we again see that uh, most of our respondents do align with some sort of policies. They could be national, institutional, or they can define their own policies. And from the uh, next graph, we can see how this uh, vary. Of course, they can uh, also be aligned with a different kind of, the same IPSB can be aligned with a policy on a national level, on an institutional level, or uh, have its own policies. So they are not mutually exclusive. And again, what Jan Eric said, it is mostly, it is more often for journals uh, than for books to have a policy of that source. Uh, how important are national policies here? That is something that was important for us to see. And again, uh, we couldn't assess that for all countries, but for those countries that provided enough responses, we can see that uh, some of them, in some of them, the majority of IPSPs do align with the national policies. So this was because we asked them uh, which are the policies and we uh, asked them to provide the links to such policies. So we saw that especially in France or in Serbia, most IPSPs do refer to national policies that are in place. Uh, but there are some other countries, for instance, that do have well-established open uh, science policies on a national level that are well communicated, but their IPSPs didn't mention them. So it is for us to question how come that they do not have such a important uh, impact on the publishers in such country. And also there is from my country, an important example where we do not yet have an open science policy in place, but most of our respondents did refer to that simply because there is a there is a national platform, there is a national funding scheme, and there is an overall uh, impression that the open science is something important. So uh, our IPSPs actually thought that uh, there is such a policy. And one th more thing to mention is that uh, national platforms do have, uh, this is something that we didn't uh, see, uh, we didn't inspect the expect this finding from our survey. But we found that many policies are actually defined on the platform uh, level and uh, national platforms have an important 
policy making role, in fact. And you can see here the name or the domains of some of these uh, publishing platforms. So we saw that they are, they are used to showcase the policies, but also sometimes the platforms define the policies and they are later adopted by the publishers and by the uh, service providers. And they are also a very nice places to gather communities, knowledge, experience, and they are seeds for something that could be later developed as a, a common uh, knowledge places and mm, a future of our project will definitely look into some uh, some actions related to that. So to conclude, national context matter, uh, national organizations uh, of different kinds, kinds that do uh, coordinate open science publishing uh, efforts within certain countries uh, are very important in aligning these aims and uh, getting uh, actually uh, things move into the right direction. So as long as our IPSPs are so sensitive to national context, it makes sense to use this, uh, uh, these common places, but also to align them and to try to build an international and global efforts based on this national context. So I will stop here and uh sorry for being maybe over my minutes for a bit actually perfect in time so first of all thank all three of you for the splendid presentations and giving you an oversight of what has happened and an insight into how much work it must have been preparing and analyzing that survey um we do have the first question in the chat, which is what aspects presented in the report would require further research in order to get detailed overviews of the scholarly publishing landscape in different countries? I will just give the word to whoever wants to speak first. I could um, make an attempt. Uh, well, this is actually a very both interesting and difficult question because I think uh, what we would like to know more about differs from country to country. Uh, there are no aspects, I think, that we wouldn't want to know more about. Uh, so, um, uh, further research is actually needed on every aspect in every country, but to varying degrees and with varying focus from country to country. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't actually know what to say. This is the most important uh, thing. Um, might be that looking further into how things are organized and financed would be of the most interest currently for for the development of open access or institutional publishing across Europe. But it might be that one of my colleagues might have a, a different opinions or views. So I, I welcome. I welcome some discussion with, with the others. Yes, Pierre. Yeah, I can give my uh, my perspective on that. Uh, so the survey itself uh, added up uh, like uh, 90 something questions, 93 or six questions. So in fact, all uh, aspects uh, of the activity of IPSPs were quite well covered by the questions. The difficulty is that, as uh, it was mentioned, in some countries, the response rate was quite low. Uh, and uh, Eva, you said that uh, due to that, uh, the representation of the situation in the, in the different countries can be uh, biased by the fact that we had uh, not uh, enough answers coming from those specific countries. Of course, we could correct the bias because, as I said, in the consortium, we had quite a good range of organizations representing the diversity of countries. So, for example, while preparing uh, the uh, um, the country report, we had uh, people representing the different countries. You know, giving more context from what they know in their own con uh, in their own country to the answers that we got from the survey, 
to to provide let's say a meaningful representation of what's going on in their own country but my answer would be to say that you know the survey is open source the survey itself is open source so it's absolutely possible for any organization in all European countries to take a, again the survey and to try to increase the response rate in their own country to have and to produce uh, a good representation of what is the situation, what is needed in their own country regarding the role and the organization and the needs of the institutional publishing service providers and the institutional publishers. I think it would be a really fantastic because, uh, for example, I have the example of the open access Dynon journal study that we did across Europe uh, and even, even more, in fact, uh, worldwide. Uh, but of course, uh, it was like a, a general landscape. And then in the different countries, we had organizations who took the same questions from the Open Access Diamond Journal study to uh, provide a more in-depth representation of the Diamond Journals in their own country and in their own national landscape. Why not having the same thing for our own survey and having national organizations doing again the survey in their own country to provide a more in-depth representation and a better representation of what's going on in the different countries. I think it would be really fantastic. Um, yeah, and Eric, would you mind if I let Eva speak first because she hasn't spoken yet? To... Okay. So maybe just to uh, answer also to this question. Uh, one thing that is uh, also within the project research further is the sustainability and funding uh, aspect of uh, differences. And that is, uh, as this is so important, so this has a dedicated work package. And there, within that, uh, there was a follow-up survey, but also there will be work on some national reports, again, not for all European countries, but certain, uh, for instance, and uh, I think 10 European countries will be portrayed uh, again from the different perspective, not just based on the data from our survey, but uh, taking into account some other uh, indicators. And then we will have again, these publishing activities in the wider context of the national uh, uh, overviews of open science in general. So it is something that also in this project will be continued, but of course, uh, having uh, detailed surveys, uh, surveys repeated in different countries would be interesting. Eric? <clears throat> Uh, yes, I'll just uh, say that, yes, uh, country local studies based on uh, local networks and also tailoring the questions to the local circumstances. I mean, we we had a survey that should be applicable to all Europe and even beyond Europe, um, which means that it might not uh, fit very well with the actual landscape and the problems and uh, laws and organization in a specific country. So that means doing this on a local basis could give better results because you could ask better questions uh, based on how the country is organized, uh, what laws there are, etc. Uh, so, so that could make it. And also, uh, some countries we had representatives in the project or we were able to find representatives that could that knew the landscape because they were from that country and worked in the in the landscape could help us write a good report for other countries we didn't find those resources so in in many countries uh, local heroes could do a much better job job than we have been able to do in in our projects uh, with these questions and analyzing them and also getting in touch with those respondents that we should want to to hear from we have succeeded in that in varying rates in different different countries um, thank you oh sorry apologies i, I see there is a, a question about the role of librarians uh, and i must confess i don't remember the details here but yes we asked about 
where these service providers and uh, where where they were in the in the institutions there and also what kind of functions they performed uh, as uh, at least for the service providers so yes to some extent you will find information in the but there you have to go to the full landscape report uh, 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 there is also a questionnaire i think i'll uh, put the the link in the, in the chat where you find which questions did we ask which is also an important source of to understand the, the, the survey. Thank you, Jan Erik. Um, and we actually do have yet another question in the chat, which is how will the find? <laughs> it's kind of a, a, an avalanche question because I can see that uh, revolving involving into a huge discussion. How will the findings of the report feed into upcoming project outputs? And I can imagine there is a lot to say about that. Um, maybe Pierre, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I can start. Uh, as we explained, uh, a lot, uh, a big part of the questions that were uh, designed in the survey were coming from the different work packages of the project, uh, defining their needs in terms of uh, uh, collecting information to develop the resources uh, in a meaningful way for uh, related to the needs of the community. So. For example, um, uh, we had uh, a kind of uh, a set of questions regarding the, the question of qual quality standards and the preparation of the EXIP and the self-assessment tool that we uh, we have been preparing in the context of the project fed upon the results of the survey. And it was the same, for example, in the work package four, where we are currently developing uh, the common uh, the common access points and the list of resources that are, will be used by the community to improve or to uh, to improve their situation. So, for example, uh, when uh, we had questions about in what domain the IPSPs are more prone uh, to uh, share knowledge and resource, for example, and to mutualize, that was very helpful for us to uh, to identify uh, the topics on which the common access point and the sharing of knowledge should focus on uh, uh, in the follow-up uh, uh, activities of the project. We had a lot of questions regarding sustainability, for example, and of course the work package five, which is dedicated to provide guidelines, resources, uh, and support uh, to improve the sustainability of the IPSPs is really feeding upon uh, the results of the survey. And it's the same for, for example, uh, we had uh, uh, um, Yannerik and Eva told about the way the IPSPs are uh, um, connected or not connected with their institutions. Uh, so embedded or uh, establishing different types of relationship with their, their, their mother institution. That's very useful. That's the kind of very useful information that we need to elaborate meaningful and useful recommendations for the top leading uh, uh, level of the institution themselves to help them better understand how their IPSP is connected to their institutional landscape, how they are connected to the institution itself, and how they can support and help them based on a, on a better understanding on the uh, articulation between the IPSP and its mother institution. So that's the type of examples where uh, the different answers coming from the survey and which are captured in the landscape report really help the preparation of all the resources that we are currently working on in the context of the DMS project. Thank you very much, Pierre and Eric. Eva, do you want to add anything to that? Well, maybe just one simple thing that uh, one of the outcomes of the project will also be a registry of uh, IPSPs. So that will be something uh, directly coming from the landscape survey because some of the respondents gave their permission to be included in something like that. So that will be a start of uh, a certain kind of networking of these IPSPs and give, giving them recognition. So, but also being part of a larger capacity hubs and uh, future uh, support networks. So that's one thing. 
Thank you very much. So I don't see any new question in the chat, so I will take this opportunity. Um, oh, sorry, Pierre. I will not take this opportunity. I will let Pierre speak. No, you can, you can <laughs> but uh, just uh, because I, I uh, quickly uh, uh, browsed through the landscape reports in search of ref precise references to, to library and the involvement of libraries. And for example, I found two types of information which are currently, uh, which are really useful. So first, there is a whole section dedicated to what we call library publishing and how library publishing is really involved in uh, uh, the development of institutional publishing and diamond open access. So you will have more information in the landscape report regarding that. And when it comes also to uh, the way uh, the IPSP is embedded in its own modern institution, of course, the role of the library uh, is assessed. And uh, in one of the table of the report, you can see that being part of an institution can be precised as being part of the library of an institution. So across the different answers, the different countries, etc., you can see also the variation of this relationship between the modern institution, the library, and the IPSP itself. So you will find uh, meaningful information regarding that in the landscape report. Yes, Jan Eric. So, just a comment uh, also that we must remember that the respondents were not all academic uh, research or uh, in, in, in universities, for instance. There's a lot of small institutions that are included. There are small societies, there are museums, there are libraries even that could respond to it that don't, doesn't have a library, for instance. So librarians might not always play a role. The landscape is more diverse than universities and you shouldn't forget that. Eva, you want to add to that? Uh, maybe just something that uh, Jan Eric mentioned that uh, uh, in uh, gathering the answers from the survey. So we initially targeted the addresses of the heads of the institutions or the heads of publishing departments. And we were hoping to get answers from them. But that, as Jan Eric said, that actually didn't prove so successful. So later, when we circulated the invitation through different emailing lists or different communication channels, what actually happened is that in many cases, librarians answer or editors, so not a head of the institution would answer the survey, but a journal editor or a librarian helping the editors or so there is uh, it wasn't designed to be answered by librarians, but it very often happened so. So that was something that was important. So quick comment that uh, uh... Our experiences from sending out the emails uh, to individuals that we found uh, re uh, reaffirms the old saying that uh, the bottleneck is, is often at the top of the bottle. Yes, Pierre, um, yeah. thank you. Thank you again for um, elaborating on that. So now I will take this opportunity to be, uh, ask completely selfishly my own questions, because as of now, I don't see any questions in the chat. Again, for all participants, please feel free to put them into the um, Q&A tool at any time. Um, so, okay, generally I have two questions, if I'm being honest. Um, one is for Eva, one is for all of you. The one for Eva would be, you mentioned that fascinatingly, um, some countries do have national policies but it doesn't seem to affect the publishers to some extent because they don't follow that or not aware that there is a national policy that could be followed. Was there any kind of um, pattern you could see or you could derive from the answers why that is the case? So why does it work for some countries but for others not? Is it connected to funding mechanisms that are connected to the national policies. Was there any kind of pattern that you could see that would explain that behavior? Because at first sight, at least, it seems odd, right? Um, and my second question generally would be, so we talked a lot about alignment and how we need to keep the diversity of the European publishing landscape, but still need to align all the efforts that go into institutional publishing 
diamond publishing in particular. And my question would be, how do we actually plan to align those efforts? Because it seems like, well, an effort of Herculean scale, right? Um, yeah, but maybe we'll start with the Tanya question. Okay, I will. Uh, well, uh, for that particular question, we don't have a, lar uh, a sample large enough to answer, to see the pattern. Uh, sometimes the answer is easy. For instance, I remember that Spanish IPSPs didn't report on their open science policies, but, uh, policy, but the, their policy was rather new at that time. So it's probably simply didn't yet had, had an effect. And the other thing is, but this is my assumption, so this is not backed up by the data that we receive, is that open science national policies usually address uh, research production and outputs, but not defined by their national publishers, but something that is an output uh, authored by the employers of their uh, institutions or the recipients of their research grants. So they focused, very, most open science policies focus on that, as far as I know. They often go, uh, don't go into direct, into the direction of defining their own national publishing landscape. For instance, Sometimes it's different. I know that the Croatian open science policies that sits in the drawer of our ministry for months now. So we try to define the important role of our national uh, publishers, but I don't always see uh, the similar case in all of the other national open science policies. So uh, with French, it's different, but then that's the one it has an effect, but often it's not. So I don't really have an exact answer, but that would be my guess. Thank you very much. That uh, was quite enlightening to me, even though I see your argument that you don't have enough data to form a comprehensive argument for that. Um, yeah. So about the second question, how do you plan to align all these efforts and to kind of give an umbrella to the institutional publishing efforts of the European research area? Do you plan that? <laughs> yes, Pia. Okay, so I can start. So as it was explained, the institutional publishing landscape is pretty much rooted in local and national context. So exact, So your question is the difficult question precisely for this reason. So to have the institutional publishing landscape rooted in the local and national context is a good point because then it's really completely connected with the communities themselves. So that's something that we want. But it's also an obstacle and a weakness in terms of aligning and trying to find synergies at European level. Uh, uh, so, for example, when uh, Eva, you mentioned the fact that most of the uh, national funders only fund their or um, most of the funders, in fact, only fund their institutional or uh, national uh, uh, infrastructure, service providers, publishers, and so on and very rarely found across the border, uh, that's that's a difficulty also because uh, if you have uh, inequalities uh, or inequity uh, uh, in the European research area, then you'd have no correcting mechanism to make sure that uh, uh, there is, a, let's say, a, um, an ecosystem that develops at the, uh, at the level of the world region. So that's uh, that's uh, really difficult. What we try to establish now uh, is uh, the dev so what we try to do is to develop through uh, Diamas but also the Craftway project uh, a mechanism uh, at a European level that supports uh, um, more synergies and more uh, resource sharing at the level of the continent and that's the development of what we call the European Diamond Capacity Hub. 
So the idea of the diamond capacity hub at European level is not to replace the institutional and the national service providers, platforms, resource providers, but to support them by uh, supporting uh, the coordination of their activities and by supporting also the sharing of resources. So that, for example, if we have, let's say, a, a publisher or a service provider developing an interesting resource, such as, a, let's say, for example, a training course or a training resource, or um, it can be a tool, a technical tool, it can be uh, a, guy, uh, a toolkit or um, any kind of resource for their own national community, it can be identified as interesting in other countries. And then the role of the Diamond Capacity Hub at European level would be to help uh, sharing this resource at European level and having other countries adopting it. So that's a way uh, to, uh, let's say, provide a better alignment between the national actors at European level. Uh, when it comes to the policy level now, uh, it's even more difficult. Uh, of course, the European Commission and the European level uh, policy authorities can only make recommendations uh because uh the uh, member states are completely sovereign in terms of establishing their policy but of course there are now uh several organi organizations or fora that help in in a better coordination of open science policy such as conosc for example which is a good forum uh, to push this agenda of better supporting institutional publishing and diamond OA publishing uh, um, at European level through the uh, better alignment between policies at national level. Sorry, my answer was quite uh, long. <laughs> no, 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 it was quite fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Jan Erik? And of course, uh, financing is always at the national level, uh, at least nearly always. It might be that one sh someone should start a discussion on establishing mechanisms on it. A more international and a European level on a ERR, um, ERRA level uh, for this, but I don't see that forthcoming very soon. Uh, we talk about bibliodiversity, and of course, it will take some decades of streamlining before the diversity has been ironed out of the, of the landscape. So I don't think we should fear that the diversity is out, but we might, I think we must uh, ensure that we don't create, for instance, uh, a national solution in every country that every journal has to adhere to because that will drive away any attempt on to diversity. So we need actually cross-border border cooperation uh, uh, so that the journals in, for instance, France has a variety of different service providers out there that can uh, give them publishing opportunities that fits how they would like the world to, world to, to work for them. Even if you have a French solution, it could be open to non-French, and French journals should be able to shop services in Germany or in, on Iceland or in, in Portugal. Eva? <clears throat> yeah, maybe just to, uh, to add that um, sometimes some things are uh, very national, but there are also examples of infrastructures that are awfully relevant to sustaining this ecosystem like uh, PKP and OJS and some other tools that are free and they are used by uh, many small players and they are actually uh, sustaining them. So we can see that especially on this ground of uh, technical infrastructures and expertise, uh, sharing uh, happens a lot easier then, for instance, translating funding mechanisms across borders. So, but uh, those are equally important areas to develop. So, maybe we will be more successful in some things than in some others. But also, the other thing that has to be mentioned, I think, and that's more related to funding and uh, political support, is that there are countries 
where uh, the value of open science is very much recognized uh, and also the value of uh, reforming research assessment that also feeds back into uh, giving value to bibliodiversity. But in some other countries, it is not so. So having uh, this, and this already in a sort exists, this uh, high level political uh, decision on the value of diamond open access publishing on the EC level is important because that will foster uh, smaller nations, those who are maybe not yet aware of these values to adopt them sooner and to then place more value on their national publishing uh, venues or something like that. So it it will work in a way, but yeah, it takes time and effort, I think. Yes, Pierre. Just a, a very quick compliment. Uh, so um, SCOS, so Spark Europe uh, developed a collective funding mechanism for open science infrastructures with the name of it is uh, SCOS. And recently, uh, SCOS pub uh, so Spark Europe and SCOS published an, a call for expression of interest uh, from different infrastructures and service providers that would be uh, in, uh, interested to be funded by the community and better supported by the community to ensure their sustainability. And quite interestingly, in the list of the topics that were light, highlighted uh, for this uh, call for expression of interest, Diamond OA Publishing was one of uh, the highlights. So that's also uh, quite interesting because, as Eva mentioned, we have the infrastructures which are developed at institutional level. So, for example, a library setting up an OGS platform for their the journals from their own university. So that's a kind of investment in institutional publishing and Diamond OA. But all of this can work only if we also support the infrastructures which are providing services across the world landscape, such as the Directory of Open Access Journal, for example, such as other, uh, let's say, shared infrastructure, uh, which are larger and across the institutional or the, even the national uh, scope only. And SCOS is very important for that to incentivize the institutions to support those shared infrastructure, which which are a common good for the world community. So I just wanted to, to also uh, uh, point the attention to, to this uh, information that SCOS is going to support better the Diamond Way publishing uh, through future call for uh, funding. Thank you very much, Pierre. I think in part you may have already um given me an introduction to the next question in the chat, which would be, what would be some concrete measures to align open access institu um, <clears throat> institutional publishing initiatives across countries? Does anyone want to add to that? Sorry, I'm muted not... myself in uh, eager excitement of your answer. Um, please go on. I'm not certain I have an answer because it's a very interesting and, um, and challenging question because you're not used to cooperating across borders in, in many aspects. So, so um, uh, I think one example is, for instance, in, in Norway, we are now discussing not to have a national uh, capacity center, but to work with the other Nordic countries to have a Nordic capacity center, because we have a lot of cross-country you know, you know, national language journals, we have a lot of cross-country publication because the languages are so similar. And we are also relatively small. So to to get enough resources to be able to do something, it would be, make more sense to do the, this on a Nordic level instead of a national level, for instance. And we also have examples of institutional publishing platforms cooperating with professional publishers or institution-based more professional publishers in other countries for types of output, for instance. Uh, but th this, uh, these are things that takes time to develop, I think. Let's see, Sona has said she wants to say something, and I'll, uh, I'll seed. 
Actually, I think it's Eva who has to say something, <laughs> so I will give the word to her. Um, jo oh, just a brief, uh, brief remark. So the Diamond Capacity Center is something conceptually different from the Diamond Capacity Hub Pierre just mentioned. Um, so the Diamond Capacity Center would be kind of an equivalent to the Diamond Capacity Hub on a regional slash um, national level, which is why Jan Eric just explained. Uh, something about a potential Norwegian diamond capacity center. And Pierre, do you want to add to that? No, I will do that after Eva. Well, maybe then I'll uh, try to also confirm that, uh, for instance, I think two weeks ago, we also, based on this landscape study, we had a regional webinar uh, targeted for uh, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, uh, Macedonia, and well, the countries that do understand more or less the same language, and it was a huge success. So there is clearly uh, a need for having this kind of regional connections that were not always there, at least not formally. So we are starting to see these small movements already within this project. But one other uh, uh, way of alignment that is going to happen uh, in this project is something that we have to mention, and it's called, the, there's another abbreviation, it's called EXIP, like Extensible Standard of Quality in Institutional Publishing, that was also, uh, well, defined within this project, and it's, uh, a sort of a guideline that should say what is a good institutional publishing, especially good diamond institutional publishing. So that is a sort, so it's not uh, an action that is taken to a line, but it is a sort of a, a guideline and something that we can look at uh, and to at least know how what do we want to achieve by aligning these uh, these different initiatives? I think. Thank you very much, Pierre. Well, so two things. Uh, first, what I find quite interesting is that you said uh, in the introduction that the landscape report didn't find any, let's say, uh, specific regional differences within Europe. So it's more differences uh, or, uh, across the countries or different types of countries, but we don't have specific regional specificities uh, in, uh, in Europe. But however, it doesn't prevent neighboring countries to work together because there are historical ties, of course, his historical links and the dynamics that exist to uh, to work together. So, whether is is it uh, it's in the Balkans or whether it's in the uh, no, the Nordic countries, for example, uh, as a French, I could say that we could uh, we could work as uh, between uh, French speaking countries in Europe, for example. That could be interesting to have a francophone network, uh, for example. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we are the same between France, Switzerland and uh, Belgium, for example. But at least we have some links that we can mobilize and we, we can work upon to uh, uh, to uh, to help each other. OK, uh, having said that, uh, for, for the uh, distinction between uh, capacity hub and capacity center, I think the best is that I share with you, and that's what I'm doing in the chat now, the link towards the discussion paper that uh, my uh, 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 co-PI in the project, uh, Johan Rorik and myself, we have uh, published recently. The idea would be to, uh, uh, to uh, try uh, to propose to the community a, a, what we call a four-level structuration, and that there is um, uh, there is uh, um, uh, a European level, which is the European Diamond Capacity Hub, that is under preparation, that would provide resource for a better alignment uh, between uh, the IPSPs, but also between the policymakers and between the funders to better support Diamond Away Publishing at uh, at the European level. So, for example, uh, in the Diamond Capacity Hub, there will be a common access point and there will be a forum. So the idea would be that the uh, institutional publishing service providers could register themselves in the registry uh, that would be managed at the, level of, at the European level and then exchange between them 
and discuss between them in the forum to better align. So that's an example of uh, better coordination as well. Thank you all very, very much. Um, I think this is actually a nice last uh, statement from Pierre because it fits perfectly well our schedule. Thank you for that, Pierre. Um, so what we have seen today is that there is actually quite a lot of work still to do, but we do have some insights into how to do them. Um, and I would like to thank all of you who have been here for, well, being here, at least virtually. Um, first and foremost, all, of course, the speakers. Thank you very much for presenting your work, um, for being here, for answering all the questions. Thanks to the participants for being here, asking questions, um, and hopefully get involved with us to some extent. So if you want to become a local hero, as Jan Erik mentioned, for example, um, feel free to visit the Diamas website and uh, subscribe to the newsletter, for example, or look for calls for focus groups and uh, further actions in which you can participate because we are always eager to work very closely with our community. And this community is you, in case you haven't noticed that yet. Um, so again, thank you very much. The slides and the um, recording of this webinar will be available to you in case uh, you want to watch it all again. Um, and with that, I would say I hope you have a splendid week. Thank you all for being here and have a nice day. Thank you to you, Sana. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.